All right, good evening, everyone. Um, we don't have a quorum quite yet. So um, I'm gonna ask for your patience. Uh, hopefully our uh, uh, committee members join us uh, pretty promptly. Uh, so let's wait uh, another minute or so before we can uh, start the meeting and uh, welcome to all and thank you for your patience. Thank you. And it's only 601, we should be fine. I expect full promptness, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we will be joined by one more member. We're, we're you know, the only one member away from uh, from quorum. Okay. Uh, let me just check the uh, the participants. <laughs> All right, we do have a quorum. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the Landmarks Committee of Manhattan Community Board 5. My name is Leila Logiziko. I'm the chair. Uh, we are going to review uh, one application tonight. Um, it is an application uh, for one Union Square West. Uh, before we go into the uh, presentation by the applicant, uh, a few words about how the meeting is going to run. Um, the applicant will have an opportunity to give a full and uninterrupted presentation. Once this presentation concludes, uh, we will open up to questions from members of the pub, from members of the committee. Uh, members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions uh, to the applicant. Once this uh, uh, period concludes, I will open up the floor to members of the public. Members of the public will have an opportunity to ask questions and make comments to the application. The applicant will have an opportunity to address those questions and comments. Once this period concludes, we will move to business session. During business session, only members of the committee are allowed to deliberate and discuss the matter. Members of the public and the applicants are no longer uh, allowed to speak unless recognized by the chair. Um, during the uh, business session, members of the committee uh, will uh, make a, a recommendation, will uh, make an opinion, uh, share their opinion, make a recommendation as to a uh, position that the committee wishes to take on the application. We will take this uh, to a vote and this motion will then be presented to the full board of Community Board 5 on Thursday, May the 12th. Uh, correct me if the 12th is not a Thursday, uh, but it is basically Thursday of the following week uh, where the full board uh, meets and uh, uh, receives um, reports from all the, uh, the committees. The uh, vote of the full board becomes the official position of Community Board 5. This vote will be uh, then shared with the Landmarks Preservation Commission and will be uh, the recommendation, uh, the official recommendation of CB5 on the matter. Um, as always, um, you know, just a reminder, members of the committee, if you have a conflict, you should uh, disclose it before you make any comments and certainly before you vote. Um, if you have a conflict, you should vote present but not entitled. So with all of that being said, I will turn to the applicants and uh, we are ready to hear your uh, presentation uh, for One Union Square West. It is an application for a uh, alteration to a door and it is an individual landmark. So uh, applicants, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, so as you said, Leila, the, the application is, is fairly uh, small. It, it, it's for the, the main entry door to the office occupancy of One Union Square West, which is a, a building that some of you probably know, some of you may know. It's on the northwest corner of Union Square West and 14th Street, uh, a building that was built in 1889, 1890, uh, designed by the architect H. H. Robertson, um, which has undergone a number of alterations over the years, both before and since its designation, which was in uh, 
I believe 1988. Uh, next slide, Emily. And perhaps I should uh, take a moment to introduce ourselves. So I'm Brian McFarland. I'm a principal with Cetrodi Architecture. My colleague, Emily Menez is also on the call. She's the one driving the screen. Uh, I, I suspect some of you know our firm. I, I confess the last time I appeared before this committee was probably 12 years ago when we were tasked with the restoration of the Bowery Savings Bank entrance at 110 East 42nd Street. Uh, so I'm glad to be back. I'm sorry it wasn't sooner. So here's a location map for the building. You can see it's, it's right across from the south end of Union Square at 14th Street. It's got a fairly limited exposure on Union Square West and a much longer exposure on uh, West 14th Street. And the, the photograph to the left is the building substantially as it exists today. Next slide, Emily. Um, so here are a couple of close-up photographs of the, the storefronts and the door on Union Square West. So the door that you see that has the number one over it, that has the stainless steel and aluminum assembly, which we think is roughly the 1960s, is what we're here to talk about. The storefront immediately south of that, which uh, Reebok currently occupies, is actually a, uh, a restored storefront that was done in the early 2000s um, to, to sort of bring the, the storefront portion of the building back to the character it originally had. Next slide, Emily. The, these, these photos show a little bit of the history of what's gone on with the storefront and the entrance to this building over the years. So um, the left-hand photo, which is the oldest one and possibly the hardest one to see as far as the entrance and the storefront goes, is from 1890 from the uh, Museum of the City of New York. But you can, you can see the storefronts there. You can't really see the entrance to the office of uh, use of the building because it's in deep shadow. The middle of the photograph from not many years later from the New York, New York Historical Society uh, looks largely unchanged with the exception of, I'm not sure that the awnings were originally there. And then the photograph from 1916 shows a fairly dramatic change to the storefront. Next, Emily. And then the storefront continued to be fairly dramatically uh, changed. In the 1940s tax photo, the majority of the retail use on the ground floor was occupied by Arnold's, I confess, even though a, a lifelong New Yorker, I don't know who they were. And then in the 1980 tax photo and 1988 designation photo, you can see that Siemens furniture occupied it. And a, a lot of the storefront had sort of been obliterated by this very large signage band. Next, Emily. So this is, this is what we all came to talk about, which is the entry door to the office occupancy of the building, which is a, a fairly small part of this building. On the left is uh, a photograph from 1898, which we actually believe to be the original entry to the building. And that uh, you, you can see that the, the building originally had a security grill. So the filling the sort of semicircle of the arch was a fixed portion of a grill. And then below that was a grill that you could pull down in a steel track, which still exists in the building. Then in sometime in the early 20th century, there was a change made. In the second photograph, you can see that there was a fairly dramatic reduction in the height of the doors and the fixed portion of the gate remains, but the vertically operating portion of the gate, which would be a, a, a security item to, to close off the building seems to have gone by then. 
The last two photographs are the 1988 designation photo and the, the current condition of the building, which show that um, glass, stainless steel, and aluminum storefront entrance that I referred to earlier. You know, fairly simple Herculite doors with a uh, a fairly heavy handed metal cladding over it. Next, Emily. So now we, what we have done is we, we've done a, a rendering here and I'm, I'm not sure you can really appreciate it here, but there are a number of things going on and I think it's useful to look at the overall building here. Uh, the left is a, a essentially current photograph of the building. The right is a rendering that we had commissioned of the building with the new entrance. And I think it's important to sort of pause here and look at the architecture of the building. So this is 1889, 1890, when the Romanesque revival was in uh, high swing, right? So, so what you had were fairly heavy, deep masonry buildings with arched openings, fairly deep openings and um, very transparent openings, which offered a, a great contrast to the heaviness of the masonry. The other thing about uh, the architecture of the building is this is transitional, right? It's 1889, 1890. So this is, I mean, it, it, we, we may laugh at it now, but this is the transitional period moving towards skyscraper construction because this is a building that does have some fairly heavy masonry bearing walls, but for the most part, it, it's a, steel and iron frame building, which is obviously what led to the rise of skyscrapers in New York. Next, Emily. So here, here's a, a sort of close up on what we're proposing here tonight on the Union Square exposure of the building. You can see um, the condition that you now have with the shortened doors, the, the sort of heavy detailing of the um, metalwork on the entrance, which we're proposing to replace with really a, a much lighter detailing and a darker detailing. Uh, the interesting thing about this slide is when you look at, in particular, because this is a close up, the third floor, the third story windows, you know, as I, I was saying, that this architecture was all about the sort of massiveness of the uh, the verticals and the arches, and the infill within them was very glassy for its age. The, the, the sticking within the opening is very limited. So what what we're proposing is an entrance that sort of harkens back to that where we're, we don't want heavy metal sticking in the opening. We, we want the, the greatest sort of negative opening, the most transparent opening in the arch. So that's much more in keeping with the architecture of the building. Next, Emily. So this is, this is simply a, a, a line drawing essentially of what we were just looking at. And you can see, and I might pause here for a moment and, discuss you know the the history of buckbinder warren's stewardship of this building so buckbinder warren has owned this building for some decades and obviously considerable alterations had been made prior to their acquisition of the building and really even even though we're here focused tonight on this very small subject of the entry door i, I think it's significant to to look at the the broader repair and restoration that Buckbinder Warren has undertaken on the building. So the, the left elevation shows the, the entry as it is today, which has been sort of stripped. The uh, columns on either side of the arch are fairly badly damaged. The arch ha has been parged at various times over the years and not sub directly under this application, but actually under an application already approved by LPC some years ago, which is still ongoing, is, is beyond the doors. We're actually um, 
restoring all the stonework and the detailing around the main entrance to the building and the arch. Next, Emily. And, and there, there's a close up to show you the difference in the, the current condition versus the proposed condition. <laughs> So one of the things that's fairly obvious or, or very obvious here, one is that we're, we're raising the height of the doors such that they, uh, they not only reach up to the architectural detail in the spring point of the arch, but also that they sort of harken back to the original doors. I don't wanna go back, but if you remember, I pointed out earlier uh, in the early 20th century, the, the door height was reduced. Um, we're, we're not clear why, but we do know that at a later point, a lowered ceiling was introduced at a, a lower height inside the doors, which may or may not be the reasoning you'll, you'll see shortly when we get to the interior of the building. Next, Emily. So this, this is uh, photographs of the lobby looking out prior to demolition. So th this photograph could have been taken as recently as a month ago. And we, we, we have begun the interior demolition. We, we've already received the uh, certificate of no effect from landmarks on the interior restoration. But, but one of the things you see here, uh, you know, th this lobby for a building this size is very small. It, it, it's narrow, it's, it's long. If you, if you can gauge yourself by the size of the elevators, it, there's very little space in this lobby. And at some point in history, alterations were made to lower the ceiling such that the, the ceiling right now is not much higher than what the original doors were. So if you look at the photograph in the middle of the page, you're in this fairly compressed space with not much daylight coming into the building and uh, a, sort of a low datum ceiling. Next, Emily. So this is, a, a, to give you a really good sense, the left photograph versus the middle photograph, we, we have now demolished the vestibule that was added at some point, as I said, to compress the ceiling height of the lobby. And, and that has really opened up the stone arch so that we can, we can appreciate how much more daylight you could get into the building by going back up to the arch height. Um, the one thing you're not seeing in this photograph in the middle, but you're seeing in the rendering on the right, is there's a, a decorative plaster frieze that goes around the limits of the lobby. And one of the big positives of removing both the vestibule and the lowered ceiling height is that we're now going to be able to restore not, not only the, uh, the freeze around the lobby, but the brackets and dimples that uh, go around the entire lobby and really define the limits of the lobby such as it was when the building was first constructed. Next, Emily. Um, this slide, uh, might bore one to tears, but there are two really significant things that are illustrated here that aren't quite so obvious. One is that uh, by reducing the amount of metalwork that surrounds the doors, one thing we're now able to do is we're able to update the building to uh, 21st century standards as opposed to you know, uh, mid-century standards so that we will have ADA accessible entries. Um, the existing doors are neither wide enough for an accessible entry, nor are they uh, friendly enough to open. Uh, they're very heavy to open so that they do not comply with ADA requirements for openable force. The new doors will not only provide the opening width for each leaf, but the hardware that's being supplied will be more than sufficient to make them uh, easily openable by uh, 
persons with disabilities. Uh, next, Emily. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, wait. Don't go back. Uh, or or go to the section. That's fine. I'm sorry. The the other point I wanted to make about this is that we're moving the doors roughly 13 inches further back into the building, and that we discovered um, after the demolition had begun, where we learned that whenever the, the current entrance to the building was uh, inserted into it, they moved the entrance further out towards the street, such that they covered and obscured some of the original limestone and granite arch. So by moving the doorway back further into the building, we're now going to be uh, not only exposing the whole depth of the arch, but we're also going to be restoring uh, the stonework that was, um, shall I say, altered to accept the current entrance. Next, Emily. This is a, a slide that we put together, uh, which we think is important. These are other H.H. H. Robertson buildings. You know, H.H. H. Robertson was a fairly prolific architect, uh, did a number of buildings in New York. And we, we wanted to take a look at sort of his attitude towards the entries of buildings. You, you can readily see on both of these examples, the Corn Exchange Building and the American Tract Society Building, the, the, the main entry to the building is, is, is always indicated by a substantial and detailed arch. But the other thing is these buildings are a, a few years later than the original Lincoln building construction. And, and you'll see, as you look at these, um, the attitude towards transparency, light and glassiness was sort of gradually increasing. Whereas the Lincoln building originally had wood style and rail doors, which had, uh, you know, a, a uh, raised panel at the lower portion, which probably amounted to being about a half, a foot and a half tall. As you can see in these two photos, as, as Robertson continued his work in New York in office buildings of similar scale, um, with similar entry details with the arch surrounded by two columns. The transparency, the glassiness was sort of increasing over time. Next, Emily. This, this, this is another uh, project our firm worked on. Uh, I suspect the number of you recognize this easily. This is uh, 281 Park Avenue South, uh, originally the church missions house, later the Federation of Protestant Welfare uh, Agencies, I think it was, FBWA. Uh, a couple of years ago, our firm was involved in converting this building into its current use uh, for Photographiska, which is a, um, a, a fine arts museum that focuses on photography. And in, in the bottom of the slide, you'll see the sort of progression of the entry doors at that building. The, the left-hand doors have fairly limited glazing. And that's from, if I'm reading right, uh, 1895, 1894, which is probably fairly original to the building. But, but then at some point in the 20th century, much glassier doors were introduced. And then, um, when we converted the building to use by Photographiska a couple of years ago, you can see again, there, there are um, much glassier doors introduced, but still with a measurable percentage of metal detailing on them. Again, our, our, our position on this is that not, not only is in-out visibility significant for the use of the building here, but it also creates a, a fairly dramatic contrast between the masonry arches and the openings within the masonry arches. Next, Emily. Uh, 
Emily. Okay, you got it. This is a, another president uh, project. Uh, this is 71 Fifth Avenue, which is right around the corner from One Union Square West. And, and you can see on the left is a bo both a historical photograph from 1911 and um, a drawing from 1906 showing the entry. So th this is, it's not an arch entry and it doesn't have... Uh, columns on either side of it, but, but otherwise in its way, it's similar for its age. It's a, um, you know, an opening in a, a fairly uh, stout masonry structure and it, and it used the door technology of the day. So it's style and rail wood doors. Um, at some point between 1906 or 1911 and, um, Today, there, there was uh, a sort of a graphic treatment done to the building that closed down the door opening and um, took away some of the detailing. And on the right, you can see that what happened is the opening was reopened to sort of refill the original opening intent of the masonry opening with uh, relatively similar doors to what we're proposing at One Union Square West, not exactly the same. And, and some of the uh, stonework was restored as well. Next, Emily. Um, the, the, this the is, what? This is the final slide. Right, so Aside this is- from the, the appendix. S sort of to, to wrap it up here, um, again, what we're trying to do is, you know, as I said earlier, Buckbinder Warren has owned the building for decades. And, and for years, you know, they, they've been sort of incrementally acting as good stewards of the building. So in the er early 2000s, the storefronts were changed to be much more in line with the original storefronts. Um, the, the windows were replaced to be very sympathetic to the original windows. The, um, there's actually a, a, a fairly exhaustive masonry restoration and repair project that's just about to begin. It, it was actually permitted by landmarks a couple of years ago, but the um, timing wasn't right. You know, timing is always a, a challenge in an occupied office building, and and now we're 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 coming to address the the lobby and the entry to the building. So we're we're trying to create a, a lobby that is much brighter and recapture some of the detailing of the original lobby, and, and we're trying to create an entrance that is both. Uh, it, it enhances the lobby experience by opening itself up more, bringing in more daylight. But it also, as I think I mentioned earlier, I, I think the detailing of the new entry door is much more in keeping with the fenestration on the original building, where the sticking of the glazing is fairly limited. You know, there's no sort of heavy... Uh, filigree on the window sticking. There's no divided lights or anything. So we're, we're, we're trying to introduce an entrance here of appropriate detail proportions to what the original blazing on the building was. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, let's open up to uh, questions by uh, members of the... Uh, committee. I'm sorry, I have to actually use my phone um, to do this meeting, which is not ideal, but uh, let's get going. Um, please, members of the uh, committee, use the um, raise hand function if you have a question. Any questions from uh, members of the uh, committee? Sorry, Leila, I forgot where the raise hand is. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> go ahead. 
<laughs> I'm going to use the real one. Um, <clears throat> excellent presentation. So my question is very um, detailed related to the size of the entry. Mm -hmm. If you can um, maybe refer to slide 12 and 13, I was curious, in order to make the doors wider, which I see the benefit, absolutely, just want to understand what material is being removed. Is that actually limestone and masonry that's being removed at the, you know, the side of the jams? No. And so, Emily, can you zoom in to the proposed plan? So um, an interesting thing happened in the last couple of months where originally we were um, inserting in, in our design documents, we were inserting the door sort of as tight to the granite water table as possible. Uh, whereas right now, you know, the, 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 the form stainless steel jams are like six inches wide. We were going down to essentially a, a two and a half inch wide frame that would abut the, the granite. And then, and I, I know I wasn't clear because I was jumping around slides, but, but the other thing that's interesting that happened when we did the demolition is we learned that when they put the current entrance in, they had not only obscured, they had covered up some of the original granite and limestone arch, but, but they had also uh, sort of savagely chopped away at it. So what we're now proposing is we're moving the door frame all the way inboard of the arch so that it fills out the original arch and, and flushes out to the interior. And what we're actually going to wind up doing, let me see if I can get this to work. So, Roughly this portion of the original arch was buried in new construction. So what we're doing is we're, we're now moving the entry back to reveal all of the original masonry arch. And unfortunately for the owners of the building, that masonry had been, uh, shall we say altered. So we're gonna have to do more restoration work than we originally expected. Karen, we can barely hear you. Oh, maybe when I gotta plug in then. Okay, I'm gonna speak loud while I plug in my headset. Um, question number two is related to the card reader at the side of the entrance. Can you just talk about um, how that card reader? Um, so that card reader is it just after hours. Is that for employees, or or how will that be functioned, and how would uh, people with accessibilities use that card reader? And is it uh, inserted into the original limestone fabric? I so think the, you showed it on page 13. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the, the card reader be, would be for off hours use. The, the, mm -hmm. the lobby is attended during business hours. So the card reader would only be for off hours. You know, I, I honestly don't know the exact hours, but let's say uh, six or seven at night till eight in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. There is, correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, but the, is, is there a card reader there today? Yes, there is. Right. So we, we would essentially be replacing uh, the card reader, which I think is mounted on the jam with a card reader that would be surface mounted on the one. Right, it's currently on the door, on the aluminum style or jam of the door right now. Okay, my follow-up question is, it's a, a little bit less of a of a appropriate uh, contextual question, maybe a little bit more to code, but when that door opens, you know, it mm -hmm. would hit a person in a wheelchair unless unless you swipe the card reader, <clears throat> one door, one leaf remains fixed and the other door remains operable, I think it's fine. But I guess the alternative, and I'm not sure, quite kind of question to the committee to think about, to consider is, you know, is this a better solution than a freestanding uh, power assist pedestal, which we sometimes see outside of a landmark where, you know, it's not 
um, touching the building and it, but it is another uh, obstacle in the, in the sidewalk. But um, just wanted to point, ask that question and point that out for the committee's consideration. Yeah, th th thank you, Karen. Um, I think indeed that uh, we, we have seen this issue, although is the card reader um, operating also as um, no. an accessibility tool for uh, disabled people? No, the, the card reader is purely a lock. Mm. The, the card reader does not operate the door. So- uh, would, the, would you actually be able to elaborate on uh, the opening mechanism that would be ADA compliant for the doors? Uh, it, it's fairly straightforward. You pull the door. Uh, that, that's why I, I, I thought I referred to, but maybe it, it was when we were discussing earlier internally. What, so one, one of the things uh, that's going to change about this is not only are the doors going to be wider, but they're going to be easier to operate. These doors are estimated to weigh 3,000 pounds and we're uh, not 3,000, I'm sorry, 300 pounds. And, and we currently have specified a, a door closer that can support a door of a um, 1,000 pounds and meet the five pound uh, operating force for accessibility. So the, the, the accessible use of the door, Emily, can you go back to the plan real quick? Sure. So e even on off hours, um, if the card reader is on the left side, as we've shown it, then with both doors closed, there, there's more su than sufficient space for a, a person in a wheelchair to approach the door because we've got over three feet clear of the right-hand leaf. So even on off hours, they can use their prox device to unlock the door and reach forward and open the right-hand door. And it meets all of the uh, accessibility requirements of uh, the New York City Building Code, ANSI, and ADA. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you know what, uh, I, I likewise can't figure out how to uh, uh, raise my hand, but when it gets to it, I, I did have a question. Okay, so um, let's go to you, Richard. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, two questions. One is just a, a technical, but can you, uh, is this slide 13? Can you go to slide 13? Yes. Yes. Uh, that one, yeah. So uh, it was not clear to me that, no, th that's it. Yeah. If you're moving the door back and there's that uh, horizontal masonry uh, that's on the, that exists and sort of up more or less up to the existing door. Are you going to be extending that masonry to, uh, to reach, uh, similarly to reach the, the new door? Are, are you talking about the, the detailing at the spring point of the arch at, at roughly, so, so the horizontal detailing are you asking the about? The horizontal or? detailing, that's about, a. Uh, you know, uh, a third of the way down from the arch, a quarter of the way down from the arch. Right. So yeah. we, we, we're not going to be replicating that detailing. We don't believe that detailing ever existed on the further in portion of the arch. Because if you remember the, um, the, the, the original entrance where they had that gate detail, we, we believe that this detailing always stopped at the gate. So the, the, the detail still stops at the, the channel for that upward acting gate. The channel is still there, the gate is long gone. Uh, a, a quick technical question from me. When you say the sticking of the glazing, what does that mean? Uh, uh, it essentially means the mullions and mud. So, and, and, and any of the metal work, any of the metal framing of the windows. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Suzanne, you have your hand up. Go ahead with your question. Suzanne, you're, you're on mute. Um, what is the detail on, uh, can you hear me now? 
Yep. Yeah. Uh, Brian, what is the detail above the columns? Um, I'm not sure what's, it looks like an animal or a figurine or something. Is that just- Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, can you Emily, can out? you go back to, go back yeah. to the historical photos of the entrance? All the right. way back, all the way back, all the way back. Gargoyles. It's, right. a, gar it's a gargoyle. Well, they're, 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 they're right. They're, they're sort of gargoyles and sort of griffins. So, so e even though this application doesn't include, uh, Emily, would you hold still for a second? Sorry. E e even though this application doesn't include the, the replication of the griffins, as I said earlier, you know, Buckbinder Warren has been doing this restoration and this res uh, repair of this building sort of progressively and incrementally. And, and the, uh, the, the recreation of the Griffins, I believe is already permitted in the LPC permit for the restoration of the limestone work. So it's, it's our intent to recreate those things to the best of our ability from the photograph shown. Uh, and Emily, uh, Go, go to the one that shows the current condition of the entrance, the, particularly the stonework. Yeah, so, so you, you, you can see that the, the griffins are gone uh, and, and not, not in, in the current photo because it's been scraped away, but at, at some point prior to the LPC, designation, someone had noticed that th there were structural issues going on with the arch. There are various cracks in the arch, which you can't really see because of the fine detailing. So you see a lot of shadow and dirt in the arch today. So at, at some point they had parged over the arch and they had obscured a lot of the detailing above the arch. So like I said, the, the, the best effort, best faith restoration of the archwork and the griffins is an ongoing project. It's just not part of this application. Okay, I just was curious, thank you. You're welcome. Just, just to clarify, um, it, are they approved under a separate uh, application? I believe yes. the griffins yes. are already approved under the application from 2015. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, all right. Any other uh, questions uh, from uh, members of the committee? Um, okay. I don't see any. I, I have a, a quick technical question. Can you actually elaborate on the metal that you're using for the door, uh, both for the frame and the handle? Yes. Uh... Most of the metalwork, both in the lobby and for the entry for the building, is going to be architectural bronze, which is Mons metal, and it's going to be finished in a very dark bronze finish. Uh, Emily, you you can go to that slide. I, I don't think it's a particularly good representation, but we have we have a little color swatch on one of the slides. So zoom into that, and this this obviously never translates well. On a, on a Zoom call, right? It's, it's like picking paint colors on the internet. Um, but it's, it's sort of as dark a bronze as you can possibly get to. We're, we're big believers in particularly where uh, metals meet the human scale, where, where people are at the metals. We're big believers in using uh, actual metals and letting actual metals come through the finish. So we're, we're using real bronze here. And um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge because we, we actually have three contractors, one doing the elevator, one doing the lobby metal work, and one doing the storefront metal work. And at, at some point we're, we're going to have to have a, a sort of overarching metal finisher who will make the three of them match. It's actually, if, if Emily, if you go to the photograph of Photographiska, it, it's probably a very similar metal finish to what we did at the old, uh, um, right, the FPWA building. Okay, a building that we're familiar with because it, that, that also came to us. Yes. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, cool. Any other uh, questions from uh, members of the uh, committee? Uh, Suzanne, you still have your hand up. I don't know if it's a uh, leftover from the previous question or if you have a follow-up question. I don't, and I, I lowered my hand, or at least I thought I did, so sorry. All right, there you go, no worries. Um, okay, so seeing no further question from members of the committee, I will open up to members of the public. Um, do we have any questions from uh, members of the public? You can also use the uh, raise hand function um, to uh, make yourself make make yourself known and indicate that you want to ask a question or make a comment. Um, let's see. Uh, Jennifer Falk. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, Jennifer, you're on mute. Uh, just want to, just to, thanks, Layla. Hi, guys. Long time no see. Um, good Hi. to see you all. Um, just want to make sure it's okay to share a, to, some thoughts and support at this time in the meeting. That would be the time. Okay, so, good. Go, okay. go okay. for it. Okay, um, so I, I submitted a letter to the office. Hopefully um, Luke or Marissa shared it with all of you. Um, I won't, um, since, since we're going on long, I won't, I won't read you the whole letter and torture you except to say that um, quite honestly, I wish I had a hundred property owners like um, the team at Bookbinder and Warren um, represented here today uh, by uh, Lori Bookbinder. Um, their um, commitment to both the neighborhood as a whole and historic preservation is, is really unparalleled. And I've been going through this process with them um, over time. And um, I'm amazed at how dedicated they are to the details. Um, and so we really believe that this project will be um, in its totality, not just the doorway, but the restoration of the facade and the re um, the replacing of the Griffins, which are just amazing, um, and all of the work that they're doing um, will just be a great addition to the neighborhood. And so they have the full support of the UNESCO partnership um, in their application. And we hope that Community Board 5 will support them as well. Um, and I hope that the next time we're doing this, I get to see you all in person. I know. I, I miss our in-person meetings so I much. Know, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, so much, Jennifer. And uh, yes, indeed, your, your letter was shared with uh, the rest of the committee. So everybody uh, received a, a, a copy uh, by email. Um, all right. Any more questions or comments from uh, members of the public on this matter? Okay, so seeing none, let's move to business session. As I said, during business session, only members of the committee are allowed to discuss the matter. Um, I'll reiterate members of the committee, if you have a conflict, uh, please make it known. And uh, with all of that being said, uh, let's go. We need comments. How do we feel about it? Renee, go ahead. Uh, I love it. I actually really love when they showed what they can do to the inside too. Like um, bringing back the freezes and everything. I mean, I just, I'm really excited to see them revitalize this building. So um, I echo what Jennifer Falk said. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. I mean, what is there not to love? I am um, just, I mean, the, the sound of bronze almost got me falling off my chair. It is so exciting. Uh, more comments from uh, members of the committee. How do we feel about that? It looks like we're going for a love fest. So let, let me ask the question differently. Um, is there any objection to uh, to this application? Is there, I see a lot of head shaking. Uh, it looks like everybody loves it. Um, all right, so <laughs> although we love these meetings and we love when it's a love fest, uh, let's bring it to a wrap if it's okay. Um, actually, Renee, do you wanna make a motion? Sure, I, I motion to approve. And yeah. I will second it. <laughs> All right, and this is our uh, only vote of the evening. So um, let's start with uh, Buzz. Maybe he's not with us. Uh, Renee. Yes. Um, Laura. Yes. Uh, John. Yes. Suzanne. Yes. Richard. Yes. Mike. Yes. Sam. Yes. Chuck? Yes. Um, Karen? Yes. 
Peter. Yes. Tony. Yes. And Leila, I mean, yes, did I miss anyone? I didn't miss anyone. All right, the motion carries unanimous vote. Thank you so much. And uh, you are not uh, obligated to attend the full board meeting. Uh, you are certainly welcome to, and you can speak during the public session if you choose to. Uh, not doing so will certainly not be held against you. And typically when it's a unanimous uh, vote from the committee, uh, it presents no difficulty at the full board. I mean, especially with the quality of the application, you should feel confident that uh, CB5 is in, is in favor. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the, the team of applicants. Great presentation, great work. Thank you to all the members of the committee. And uh, with all of that being said, I wish you a lovely evening and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. So thank much. you so much. This is really great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.